Well, we're we're socially isolated. Yeah, still. Well, we've been that way for years, but <laughs> now we're doing it by government edict. Yeah. <laughs> but no one ever said you can't drive around. Yeah, you can do that. And just keep your distance from everybody else. Don't run into them with your car. And right. You should be fine. No more than ten people in your car. That's right. So anyway, we're heading over to Garage Mahal to work on the railroad because we've been working on the railroad quite a bit during the um, pandemic. Pandemic. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So anyway, that's where we're headed, Garage Mahal. A little update on our work over there. So check this out. Well, just by way of a quick recap, it's been quite a journey now for over six years. Well, I will say. And what a project. This is what the garage looked like when I just had all of my collectibles stored in here. And we started rebuilding this into Garage Mall. <laughs> oh, my. Can you? I, I just sometimes I forget what a massive project this has actually been. But bit by bit, it's gotten better and better and betterer and uh, it is now Garage Mahal. Anyway, it has been quite a process, but it is, uh, it's finally a shop, isn't it? It is. Now, I've been working on uh, track plans and other ideas in uh, software, LightWave software. I love figuring things out in 3D software uh, and then transferring those to the real world. Back here in the fenced-in area will be the Garden Railroad portion of Garage Mahal. Now, as we've been mentioning on the channel, one of our major goals at Garage Mahal is to have a Garden Railroad. And this is it the is. area back here where the Garden Railroad is going to be built. It's a nice little fenced-in area. It was just last fall that we put this fence around. Yeah, and now the area is secure and we can go back to work on the actual railroad in this area. So that's gonna be fun. It will be. So the track plan for the actual outdoor part of the railroad consists of a loop-to-loop, dog-bone-style railroad where uh, one end of it's uh, in a planter, one side of it's built into a fence uh, this section over here, which we call uh, the grapevine, because uh, it fits. Because there's actually a grapevine growing over there. <laughs> there is. It looks a little scraggly this oh, time looks, of year. It looks pretty bad. <laughs> but later in the year, it's pretty nice. Anyway, that's where that latticework fence is going to go across there. And then we will be cutting a hole right here in the side of the garage so that the trains can go inside. Now inside the garage, there's gonna be a lot of different sort of railroad areas, but the key here is this switching yard right here. A nice place to park the trains when the trains aren't actually being used. So three tracks wide switching yard right here for storage of stuff indoors out of the weather. Now I built this quite some time back out of, as you can see, chipboard. And my original plan was to simply glue the railroad ties directly to the chipboard and then uh, spike the rails to the ties, of course. But I did keep thinking that I'd rather put down homosote first. Uh, that's the way I've historically always done that. But you just can't get homosote anymore. I can't find it anymore. But you can get this stuff. This is sound deadening board. Homosote's made out of like a compressed paper. And this is made out of more like a compressed sawdust. This is almost exactly the same as particle board. It's just that it's held together with a really, really, really flimsy glue. It just falls apart if you look at it funny. There's a lot of advantages to having some easily removable, easily cuttable, uh, soft material like this between your bench work and your ties. So a little, a few quick measurements here and voila. I now have my sound deadening board all cut out and laying in place on top of the chipboard. Now I did have to cut a, a rounded section down here because at the far end of the railroad uh, uh, yard there is the engine shops and the engine shops have this great big huge uh, backdrop cove that Steve and Al built some years back. And uh, so it has to tie into the curvature of that. And so I had to kind of measure that out and figure that out and then cut my homosote to fit the big cove here. 
As always, I've got my cart slightly ahead of my horse because I haven't actually built the bench work down here yet. But I wanted to get the uh, homosote cut out. Now I'm going to have to come back and build bench work that goes into that cove. But in the meantime, I can go ahead and start laying track here on top of my, uh, my sound deadening board, which takes the place of the homosote. But I do have to get my homosote mounted in place, make sure that my seams are all tight and everything, or it can create no end of grief when you start laying track. Now I just screw the homosote, or in this case the sound deadening board, in place with grabber screws, no glue, because one of the keys here is you can remove the screws and lift a section out if you want to put in a switch or change your track work slightly. You can just lift a little section out and redo it. So now to transfer my track uh, design onto the sound deadening board, some measurements and whatnot. Now I, before I proceeded to put down real track, I set some uh, flex track in place and some cars in place uh, just to confirm my clearances and to make sure that everything was going to work. Because I'm actually cheating my clearances a little tiny bit close. Normally I'd want eight inches between my tracks, but in order to save space, I've cheated that down just, just slightly. And so I need to confirm that nothing's gonna bash into anything else. The lines here represent the track center and then the far end of the ties. And these are the ties. They're cut out of uh, red cedar, same sort of thing that you would build a fence out of. The neat thing is there's so much variation in the wood that they take stain differently and they come out looking very unique to each other. So the ties are just going to be glued to the sound deadening board. Uh, this is the process again that I've always used and I'm sort of used to it. Later on here, a little issue came up with this, and for the next track over, I might rethink it slightly. Not really sure. Uh, we'll come back to that. In the meantime, I'm just going to go ahead and get my ties down. Now, I'm actually being pretty careful to get them as straight and square and lined up with my lines as possible, knowing full well that they're going to come out a little tiny bit crooked and a little bit off from the center line and so on. Uh, exactly the way real railroad ties would. But I don't want to make it too, uh, too extreme, so I'm going to actually try to make it pretty square and pretty straight, and then that way uh, things will come up with just the right amount of variation. Now working in smaller scales at this point, I would go through here with a belt sander and make sure all the ties are the exact same thickness and therefore have an absolutely flat, smooth top to them. But in this large scale, it's really not necessary. I, I tried test fitting that by just laying some rail in place and uh, be darned if it, uh, if it isn't just fine exactly like it is. The, the cars roll easily on there. I'm using the little snap on uh, track gauges from microengineering. Now I had also planned on putting down tie plates. I'd used these in the past on a trestle that I built and I really liked the look of it. So I thought for the entire railroad here, I'm going to put tie plates under the rails between the ties and, and the rails. But here again, I'm sort of rethinking that. So Karen's warming up her uh, drafting skills over here while she also warms up her feet. Nothing like a little bit Felix the cat and coffee. <laughs> The goal being to go to work on the backdrop, which uh, Karen's painting. Art lessons from Robbie. He's the one that taught me how to do the trees this way, so I'm trying to do it like he taught me. Well, and he did the, the far right end, and now we're trying to pick up the rest of it using uh, Robbie's techniques. Exactly. But it looks to me like you've kind of got his technique down. It's kind of fun once you get onto it. Yeah, it is. It's, it's actually, we've got a video on that. So if you want to know uh, what Robbie showed us and exactly what we're doing here, because this is uh, all stuff that Robbie showed us. And I am now ready to stain my ties. What I'm using is Watco's Danish oil in uh, the dark walnut, and I'm using mineral spirits as a thinner. Looks kind of like milk, but don't oh, drink it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's mineral spirits, and it makes a great thinner for the Danish oil. Uh, and the Danish oil sure smells a lot better than actual creosote. 
What I'm doing is uh, putting the Watco oil directly down onto the ties and then coming back with a second coat of mineral spirits and kind of working that back and forth and forth and back. I'm not actually mixing the Watco with the mineral spirits. And then I'm coming back and putting a coat, a very thin coat of acrylic uh, paint over the top of the whole thing in a light tannish gray that looks very much like the weathered wood. And I'm very very lightly dry brushing that on so rather than painting it directly from from uh, the bottle or something I'm, I'm using a palette and taking most of the paint off of the brush and then coming back and just dry brushing a, a very thin thin coat of the light gray tan uh, acrylic paint over the top of the whole thing to give it a weathered wood look now it does tend to look a little bit like a, a weathering technique, it, it isn't bad, but I want it to be a little smoother and a little more homogenous than, than this. Uh, I, I like the look, but I like it a little bit better if it's toned down. Moreover, some of the ties take way too much paint, you know, when you're dry brushing, it's just kind of the nature of it. So what I'm going to do is come back with yet another coat of Watco and Mineral Spirits and just kind of blend that carefully over the top and then some more acrylic and then back to a wash and eventually I'm going to end up with something that I think looks a lot like weathered wood. Now also notice that I have painted the rail. I used uh, Krylon's camo paint <laughs> that you can pick up over at Walmart in a kind of a dark brown color. It looks really nice on there. And then before the paint dries, take a little thinner and wipe the paint off of the top of the rail and the bottom of the rail very easily done while the paint is still soft. And now I'm ready to start uh, spiking the rail in place but I wanted to stick my tie plates underneath there and then spike the whole thing in place. And this is where things went sort of wrong. Uh, the tie plates are just loose under there. And it's like, well, that's, that's very tricky. It's tricky enough spiking this without the tie plates in there on the loose. So I thought, well, I'll glue the tie plates in place, but then gauging the track becomes really difficult. And it's like, well, I, I, so I don't want to do that. So I popped all of my tie plates back off of the ties, going, well, maybe I should glue the tie plates to the rail instead, or just try uh, spiking them in place on the loose. None of that worked. <laughs> So anyway, I decided to just go ahead and spike it down. Uh, the spike here on the left is the microengineering large spike, the one next to it, the medium spike. And I thought I would use the medium spike, but in practice it turns out that they're too small. I need to use the large spike. And at this point, I was really glad I'd put down the sound deadening board because that spike is so long, it goes all the way through the tie and it would have been going into the chipboard, making putting the ties in, uh, the spikes in, much more difficult. So I'm going to be pushing the spikes into place using spiking pliers. I got these from uh, Micromart. I'm not sure who makes them. But you'll notice that they have a little groove machined into the end that grabs a hold of the spike and holds it nice and square while you push it into the tie. Really facilitates putting in your spikes. Now I was concerned that I wouldn't be able to pick up these really large spikes that way, but now it works perfectly. Uh, fits right down into the notch and, and went quite smoothly. So you simply get the spike right up against the rail and once it goes all the way through, it just pops through because it goes into the sound deadening board and it just snap the spikes in place. I've got both rails in place and I'm just using those little snap on gauges to hold it all in place. And at this point, I can just go through and spike a tie here and a tie there. I'm not doing every single tie just yet. In fact, I finally got to the point where I was only spiking it about every six inches or so just to get it temporarily in place. Then I was ready to add another rail, and so I need to use the rail joiners, uh, microengineering's rail joiners. They're just like the rail joiners you use in the smaller scales and so on. These are made of aluminum, and I've got a little bit of concern about that because I hate to mix aluminum with other metals because sometimes that goes badly when you run electricity through it. At any rate, there it is. There's the, the rail joiners in place and then I'm going to have to come back with a little paint and whatnot and try to disguise those slightly. But then I, uh, 
I laid all the rail in place all the way to the far end of the yard and then just started spiking every six inches or so. And that opens up the possibility of uh, screwing around with it for a while and pushing some train cars around. And gee, for the first time, train cars are actually going back and forth in the switching yard. And so that's a, a momentous occasion. And now to go back and spike every single tie. Uh, on the back track here, I'm not using the tie plates, but uh, I am planning to use the tie plates on the other tracks. It's just that this one's right up against the backdrop and adding the tie plates just proved to be way too difficult. And so this very back track will just be spiked in place, but it'll be spiked on every single tie. That really looks like real railroad track. Yeah, your actual three foot gauge uh, railroad track. The layout's coming together quite nicely. It's starting to. Yeah, Garage Mahal. It's actually becoming a thing, isn't it? So it's getting there. It is. It's almost, a, I mean, the yard part of the railroad is almost a railroad. And now that the weather's turned mostly nice, it was snowing this morning. You wouldn't know it to look at it, did you? And now it's beautiful, but that's... That's spring in Utah, so. <laughs> but we will be getting out into the yard. In the meantime, we're working in the yard. We've got the backyard and the switching yard. Right now, we're working in the switching yard. Right, indoors. Indoors, and, and there's a bunch of other places on the railroad inside that we're going to continue working. Um, one thing about being socially isolated, I'm noticing all kinds of people promoting here on the channel, or commenting, rather, here on the channel, are getting an awful lot done. <laughs> right, and I've actually gotten a lot done in cleaning a few closets yeah. and finding but a few things. Hobbies and, and uh, mm -hmm. stuff to say, stay sane, walking the dog seven times a day, things like that. Mm -hmm. And so it's not it's not all downside, don't, don't get me wrong, nobody wants this to happen, but in trying to find the silver lining in the cloud, um, being stuck inside isn't that bad. Not really. No. Not really. And especially when you can also do what we're doing right now, not just get out and drive around. Right. Get out and get some sunlight, walk around, drive around, just don't... Mingle with people. Don't mingle <laughs> with people, exactly. Yeah, stick to yourselves. <laughs> well, if you haven't been over to the channel, pop on over to the channel. And if you're not a subscriber, please subscribe. Helps us out, helps you out. Uh, I don't think it'll help the pandemic situation, but it, everything else will, will come out better, better for it. <laughs> and the easy way to subscribe and get over to the channel and everything is to click the blue button. Are we ready for it? Mm -hmm. Zoing. <laughs> the big blue button right there. Well, we're not sure how you found this movie on the internet. We hope you didn't find it boring. And we will see you on uh, Tuesday. Tuesday, wow. With some collectibles and stuff. See you then. Bye-bye. <laughs>